And today we hear from uh, Dr. Tudnam. Yes, may, Professor May Dr. Tudnam, Tudnam be sworn. Please state your full name. I am Edward George Denley Tudnam. And take the book in your raised hand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God... I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth shall be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth Now Dr. Tudnam if at any stage you uh, want a break please just let us know will you Yes um, Professor Tudnam, I'm going to start by asking you just to give us an overview of, of um, your career. Um, your statement tells us that you were a senior house officer and registrar in pathology at the United Liverpool Hospitals, uh, 69 to 71. Correct. Um, and then you moved to the University Hospital Wales in uh, uh, Cardiff, where you worked under Professor Bloom from March 1972 to the end of 1975. That's right. And I'll ask you a few questions about that in a moment. You then moved to um, uh, the States for a period of time. You were a research associate at the University of Connecticut, 1976 to 1977. Yes. And what was the work that you were undertaking there? I had two projects. One, I was looking at human endothelial cells, which had just recently been established in culture, so one could study how they reacted to various stimuli and whether they produced factor VIII or von Willebrand factor, as we then called it, factor VIII related protein. And the other project was purifying factor VIII using immobilized columns of antibodies raised in rabbits. Uh, and then um, you returned to the UK and you took a post at the Royal Free Hospital at the beginning of 1978. Yes. Now, that's going to be the focus of, of, of most of my questions, you'll understand. But just to get the dates, um, you were, for the first half of 1978, appointed, I, I think, on a locum basis. Yes. Uh, and then your role became permanent in, in around September of 1978, and you were joined in the course of 1978 as a co-director by Dr. Peter Kernel. Yes, that's correct. Uh, you remained in that position until 1986. Yes. Um, and, and you were doing work with, with, with Spaywood during that period, which again we'll come on to at a later stage. Where did you then move on to in 1986? I was uh, able to join the Medical Research Council with my own uh, Research Council supported group. They first sent me to the National uh, Medical Research Centre at Mill Hill for some retraining in molecular genetics, and then I moved to Northwick Park where I set up my research group recruiting uh, scientists who I knew or had met while I was at Mill Hill. And what was the principal focus of your research there? We were going to use the new tools of molecular genetics and protein chemistry and structure function determination to study in more detail the properties and activities of the various components of the clotting mechanism both at the protein structure function biochemical level and also at the genetic level. And we were using those tools to discover new mutations and identify genes that previously were only known from clinical studies. And uh, we were able to, for example, establish the cause of some rare genetic diseases and uh, use the knowledge we gained from studying the pathology of abnormal molecules to understand more about the normal structure and function of clotting. And then um, you took up a post as a professor of hemostasis at Imperial in 1994. Yes, this came about because Northwick Park uh, Research Centre was closed down and the MRC uh, dispersed the groups who were working there, some of them to a new centre which they set up at the Hammersmith hospital site on Duquesne Road and I was uh, with one of those groups that moved to the new centre and Imperial College kindly bestowed uh, a professorial chair 
on the at that point. Um, um, the, the, um, your role there, did that remain a, a research and academic role or did you have clinical responsibilities at that stage? It remained a research and academic role, although I did uh, interact more with the Haemophilia Centre there, Professor Lafan, and provided some advice on cases and also was interacting with the clinical teams of the haematology department. And then you returned to the Royal Free Hospital in January of 2006. In what capacity? I returned there as a Professor of Haemophilia. We established a new chair in the name of Catherine Dormant, which had been one of her original intentions. And uh, I was also a director of the centre, so that I was clinically in charge of the, uh, by then, much enlarged uh, haemophilia centre and thrombosis unit. And my major role, as stated at my uh, interview, applying for the post, was that, uh, if possible, to initiate studies on gene transfer, gene therapy. So you, you took over the role of director on Professor Lee's retirement? Correct. Um, um, although director, was your principal work there still the, the research work? Actually, no. I would say I was able to devote about 30% of my time to research. There is a large component, of course, of administration. There was a reorganization going on for the haemophilia services. The Panthems Haemophilia Consortium uh, was considering the future of the um, service, and there had been a, a, a proposal that it should be privatized, which I resisted vigorously. Um, and of course, uh, managing a, a, a large clinic, both uh, active for our patients with haemophilia, but several other conditions, and also a, a thriving um, and active uh, women's clinic, uh, which was uh, w with colleague um, Professor now, Razan Kadir, uh, an obstetrician, and we were providing an, an interesting and I think very valuable service there. So I was very active clinically, very active in um, management issues as well as running the research. And that was a post you held until July of 2011. Yeah. And then your statement tells us that, that you're, you still hold the post of honorary consultant haematologist at the Royal Free. D does that involve any active um, clinical work or research work or both? Uh, both. I'm active in our several trials of gene transfer, gene therapy in haemophilia A and B. Um, in, in, you were a member of UKHCDO during that first period, 1978 to 1986, and you were one of the reference centre directors. And we'll come back to that. I'm going to ask you some questions about that. You were also on the medical advisory panel of the Haemophilia Society. What did that, by and large, entail? Yes, a Haemophilia Society would uh, get an advisory panel together on a regular basis. I think it was three or four times a year. And it, it was relatively informal. Um, the issues of the day were uh, raised and discussed uh, with the chairman and secretary of the Haemophilia Society. Uh, the, the chairman in those days um, had uh, one of his, uh, his son was one of our patients, as it happened. Of course, it's a very much a family concern, haemophilia. And um, we would, uh, I would say, debate, discuss in a sort of fairly relaxed way. Uh, but of course, the whole issue of infected blood and AIDS was uh, ever more present, and so there were discussions about such issues to which I contributed, mostly when um, asked more about uh, issues of diagnosis um, and the technical aspects of uh, the kinds of assays that we carried out, which were a big focus of my interest. I'd say the, the more clinical aspects tended to be dealt with more by Peter Karnoff and other colleagues. Um, and you also sat for a period of time on the Advisory Committee on the Virological Safety of Blood um, during your 
MRC time. Yes, I was called back into that committee. Uh, we'll, um, we'll, we'll look at the, some minutes of, of, of um, decisions of that committee at a later stage of your evidence, Professor. C can I just take you back um, to then the, the first half of the 70s, 72 to 75, when you were in Cardiff working under Professor Bloom? As I understand it, this is when your interest in, in haemophilia bleeding disorders was particularly sparked. Yes, I was a lecturer, but I was uh, in a training post, and so rotating through the various sub-sub-specialties uh, of uh, haematology, ranging across from the malignant management of malignant cases, uh, acute and chronic leukemia, myeloma, lymphoma, and also laboratory management, examination of blood films, examination of bone marrow, taking bone marrows, examination of tissue histologies. And so I, I got a very thorough training in all those aspects. There was uh, active research in that unit, and um, particularly interesting, it became to me more and more so, was the research that Arthur Bloom was managing, and he became a, a mentor to me in uh, the studies that he was undertaking into what were then the unclear and even mysterious relationship between the different factor eight deficiency disorders, haemophilia A and von Willebrand disease. Um, uh, were there any other particular research projects that you can recall um, that Dr. B uh, Professor Bloom was undertaking at that time other than the von Willebrand's research? They were interested in platelet disorders as well and he helped me make a first observation of a complication of a platelet disorder which involved the lung, which often gets quoted. But his interest did, was mainly around haemophilia A and von Willebrand disease, and he'd collected a large cohort of patients and families with those conditions, which were studied in parallel, trying to disentangle the relative causation, uh, which became the key to much of my later research. Uh, he gave me a couple of other research projects that were interested in the time at which factor eight first appears during embryology. They were studying the distribution of factor eight in tissues, its synthesis. So he had a broad research program. It, it was very active. It was, the, to my mind, the best research program in the UK at that time on, the, on these fundamental issues. And to what extent did you have involvement in any of the um, uh, the clinical practices of, of Professor Bloom at Cardiff in terms of his interactions with and treatment of patients? Uh, I was, when the patients came in, as they all did in those days, for on-demand treatment, uh, I would be um, responsible when I was in that section of my rotation, training rotation, for uh, treatment, which, of course, we gave as, as quickly and as efficaciously as we could. Um, home treatment wasn't at that time developed in in Wales. I hesitate slightly, but I wasn't aware there was any home treatment at that time. Cat Catherine Dormandy was a pioneer in introducing home therapy uh, in, in London. Uh, so I, I would be involved with the immediate treatment. The outpatient clinical work, I would sit in with Professor Bloom when he was seeing patients and setting up diagnosis and treatment programs. Um, going on ward rounds, seeing the patients when they were admitted. Uh, the usual training role of a trainee haematologist. And can you recall um, whether there were any particular um, discussions about, uh, with, within, the, within the department, about uh, the risks of hepatitis at that time? I've racked my brains over that, and I can't remember, recall it at all. The risk that we particularly looked at and focused on was um, inhibitor, the development of antibody to the factor eight, which means the patient becomes resistant to treatment, because at that time we, we had very few options for treatment for a patient in that situation. Okay. Um, w w we understand from, from other documents that the inquiry has seen that Professor Bloom took a direct and active role in deciding what concentrates and treatments and blood products should be used, had a number of direct interactions with pharmaceutical companies. Did, were you involved in any of that, or did you observe any of that when you were there? Um, 
No, I wasn't involved and I didn't observe it. Uh, do you know whether um, uh, blood samples were stored in Cardiff in the way that we know Dr Kernoff stored samples at the Royal Free? I'm sure samples were being stored because one would often need to have a particular sample for a particular experiment. So it's useful to have samples from a patient with no, uh, severe form of haemophilia because we use them in the one-stage assay. Uh, and from the patients with von Willebrand disease where one had several different assays to perform or develop looking at different aspects of that um, condition, samples would have been stored. I don't remember there being a plasma bank of any size. Um, can we move on then to the Royal Free Hospital which, and the Haemophilia Centre there, which you, you joined in 1978. Um, you were, if you don't mind me saying so, relatively young at that eight, the point in time when you were appointed. And your clinical practice had been a in terms of haematology, had been what you've just told us about in Cardiff. Yes. Um, what, Dr. Kernoff, too, I think, was relatively young at that time, at yeah. the time of his appointment. What had his route to becoming director been? Do you know? He'd been doing some research in Oxford, and he um, went from there to work with uh, Dr. Hamami Nussel in New York, and I believe it was there that he became most interested in the aspect of hepatitis and treatment with factor eight or factor nine products. And um, so he was still working on those projects when he was appointed as the clinical NHS director. And I'd been appointed as Catherine's successor to a senior lectureship, um, so an academic appointment. So. When he eventually came to join us, we were co-directors, which I think is, was a unique arrangement, and I'm not aware of another such uh, arrangement in the UK or elsewhere, but we, because we had parallel but distinct interests, that worked very well, that I could focus on the academic and research, and he focused also on research, but mainly on the clinical service. And what, what can you tell us about the facilities at the, the, the Royal Free Haemophilia Centre when you arrived in 1978? What, what did they comprise? Uh, on day one, it was uh, still very um, minimal, really. Uh, we weren't still using the caravan that had been the place where Catherine saw patients when she started her haemophilia centre. Uh, we were using um, part of um, the hospital was newly built and a purpose-built centre was ready and empty and waiting for us to move into. But in the first weeks before we moved in, we, um, uh, we just had a couple of offices and um, a small lab area and we saw patients in the general outpatients and patients who came in went, needed to come in, went on to the wards. I moved the centre once I was appointed into the new purpose-built area uh, on two floors on a corner of the hospital. And um, it was a, a blank sheet. I had to decide what went where, who did what, and uh, make it up as I went along. And, and uh, uh, in terms of uh, where the clinical care was done, was that the, the, the sense we got from Professor Lee's evidence yesterday, obviously she was describing things when she arrived at the beginning of 1983, was that there was um, an, an area with a, an, a number of rooms, but all located together. Yes. Um, and Dr. Kernoff was based there. Yes. And that's where patients were seen. That's where Professor Lee was based, the nursing staff and so on. Uh, were you based on the floor above? Uh, yes, I had my office upstairs near to the lab and my research group. Uh, and um, w again, Professor Lee described to us from 1983 onwards... Um, uh, that there were regular meetings, she, she talked about Tuesday meetings and Thursday meetings uh, of the whole department to discuss various different matters. What, what, could you, can, what can you recall about those? Yes, in our multidisciplinary team meetings, we were kept 
a whole principle was to bring everybody together so that everybody knew what was going on, including laboratory staff. And um, because the key to running haemophilia care effectively is to have a well-developed uh, laboratory. It, it's, a, it's a clinico laboratory specialty par excellence, uh, which is one of the things that attracted me to the specialty. And so we would also have the physiotherapists, the psychosocial workers, social worker, um, and nursing, of course, and um, medical staff. And we would go through the uh, is aspects of clinical care and technical aspects of laboratory observation and um, monitoring. Now, um, in terms of the, the, the treatment policies and practices when you arrived, we've got a, a, a description from you uh, in a seminar that you participated in in the 1990s. Could we have dub, sorry, RLIT 5022, please, Henry? Um, this is uh, a, 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 was described as a witness seminar, February 1998, Haemophilia, Recent History of Clinical Management. A number of people participated, um, in, including yourself. And if we could go to uh, its page. Henry, if you look in the bottom right-hand corner, it'll be page 35, but I'm not sure what page that is electronically. It'll be more than 35. So if you go 10 pages further on. So we can see the description here. Um, uh, we could pick it up with Professor Lee's observation at the top of the page. She says, in our centre, we were a bit slow to use large full clotting factor concentrate because it wasn't really until you and Peter Kernoff came that people were started on this treatment because Catherine had been so taken up with the cryoprecipitate. And then Dr Matthews um, um, uh, makes an observation. And then if we can just see what you then talk about... You say, Catherine had a wonderful relationship with her patients. It was maternal in some ways because she knew them all very well and their social circumstances. She put a very great deal of effort into ensuring that they would have the best possible circumstances for home treatment. She was a pioneer in that area and obtained, as you mentioned, money for them to have freezers in their own homes in which they kept cryoprecipitate. I would say that, to be fair to Catherine, it was difficult, as other speakers have mentioned, to obtain adequate supplies of higher purity concentrates other than for surgery, and the centre's treatment relied very much on cryoprecipitate produced through local blood transfusion centres. Things changed, of course, when Peter Kernoff and I came in after Catherine tragically died, and the concentrates were brought in progressively through battles against the controllers of the finances. Uh, although, to do them justice, they did progressively increase the fraction of local capital that was being expended on imported concentrates until they reached towards the dizzying heights of today. So it was a transitional phase. Catherine was a pioneer, and it undoubtedly changed the lives of our patients at that time to have their own freezers filled with locally produced cryoprecipitate. I think there was a period of time when, um, when you first took up your post, when Dr. Dormandy was still still there, not not long, I think, before she before she died. Um, but you did work with her for a short period of time. And not in the clinic. She had actually become more or less bedridden by the time I arrived and took over. So she was no longer working when I started. Um, but th that, that is an accurate description, is it, of, of uh, um, what your understanding was of how things had been organised at the centre under Dr Dormandy? Yes. Um, so pr predominantly cryoprecipitate, um, uh, at least for adults. Y your statement suggests that children may already have been on... NHS concentrates by then. Is, is that right? That's right, yes. We were treating children with concentrate. I can't remember giving cryoprecipitate to a child with severe haemophilia. And um, so, yeah, that's my recall. And, and, and do you know? why children um, in particular were on NHS concentrate at that point in time, the adults still on cryo? There's an issue of volume and the concentrate was a <laughs> as the name, it's the clues in the name, it's a much smaller volume to give 
it's easier to give it. And with children, you tend to use very fine needles, especially the youngest children. And cryoprecipitate doesn't easily go through uh, a fine needle. It's it's very it's sticky. It's actually it it's mostly fibrinogen, which is a big sticky molecule with a little bit of factor eight. And uh, so the concentrates were a big step forward for treating small children. C can you recall the extent to which, at the time you arrived, there was m use of commercial concentrates? We had access to some. It, it was there in the mix. Um, but uh, it, it gradually became the case that we used more and more um, as is shown by all the documents you have from Peter during his time uh, obtaining and resources and running the clinical service. And, and then um, what else was available for treatment in, in 1978? Was DDAVP being used already at that stage in the centre? No, we didn't get... We did start using DDAVP pretty soon after Minucci had described its utility and uh, the exact time at which we were using it regularly is sometime after 1980. Uh, and then uh, in terms of those with haemophilia B, and again, I'm just looking at the point in time in 78 when you and, and then later Dr. Kernoff arrived, what, was haemophilia B already being treated with NHS factor nine concentrates at that point? Or? Uh, yes, it was, yes. And, and what treatments were being used for those with inhibitors? Right. Um, for hemophilia A with inhibitors, we didn't have any um, resource other than to try giving a large dose of factor VIII. The observation that factor IX concentrate could be helpful was made by somebody who accidentally gave factor IX instead of factor VIII. Um, and in hindsight, the reason that worked was that the factor IX concentrates we were using in those days were a mixture of clotting factors, some of them already activated. Clotting factors circulate in our blood in a pro or precursor or prozyme form and become activated during the process of forming a clot. Uh, but it, when purifying factor IX, you end up with a mixture of related factors, some of them active, and so the um, the factor IX concentrate of the day was actually uh, quite effective in treating patients with antibodies to factor VIII because the active factors jumped over the block and a so-called bypassing agent. And then that was formally developed into the product called factor VIII inhibitor bypassing agent fiber, which is a, a sort of activated factor IX complex concentrate. So we, we were beginning to have some um, new tools, but it was a while before we got the activated factor seven, Novo seven. Uh, we, we were struggling with patients with inhibitors. So the, the major change then that was instituted um, under the new directorship was the shift from cryoprecipitate for home therapy to concentrates. Yes. Why was that decision taken? If one uh, makes up cryoprecipitate practically one soon encounters the fact that it's a variable product, it's got to be thawed, it's very um, the amount of factor 8 in it varies quite a lot so you have to give 5 or 10 bags, you've got to thaw out each one, draw it up, this gloopy material in, through large diameter needles into syringes over, it, it's time consuming and then infusing it is a slow business because of its viscosity. To go from that to a little bottle with a defined amount of factor eight in it that you just add the usually water for injection to it, um, it dissolves pretty quickly, draw it up easily and give it fairly quickly. That's obviously a big step forward and it was appreciated by everyone, not just the doctors and nurses, the patients we could say, and, and the material uh, can be stored in a domestic refrigerator, doesn't have to be in a freezer. So it, it, it had many obvious practical advantages, 
And uh, also, in the case of requirement to elevate factor level in the patient up towards or in the normal range, surgery, head injury, life-threatening bleeding, um, it was much more reliable to achieve that than the use of cryoprecipitate. So practical considerations, convenience, efficacy. What consideration was given to the relative safety of cryoprecipitate and concentrate? It was pretty early on noticed, by the way, with cryoprecipitate at first, that multiple donor treatments, for example, 5, 10, 20, 50 bags of cryo, it exposed you to 50 donors, and within a year, less than a year of Judith Poole publishing the method for making cryoprecipitate, uh, the fact that there was an increased incidence of hepatitis was reported on. So we already knew that multiple donor exposure enhanced your chances to, um, for blood-borne infection, hepatitis. Um, the fact that in making concentrate, one pulls hundreds to thousands of donations of plasma uh, very obviously increases exposure to numbers of um, donors and therefore to whatever transmissible agents they may be carrying. So I believe that was appreciated, but um, the extent to which that was a risk uh, in numerical terms wasn't sufficiently appreciated in hindsight. Uh, we had already encountered hepatitis in subjects who'd received hundreds by the time they'd uh, been on cryoprecipitate regularly on demand for a year or two or three. They would have clocked up the number of exposures to, to uh, get hepatitis. Um, so switching to a product which perhaps in the way, rather naive way, we considered it, oh, well, they've already been exposed. This is not going to change that. Uh, was, I think, the kind of appreciation we had at the beginning. Um, we didn't see a sudden change just by going to concentrates from cryoprecipitate in the patients we were treating who we'd already been treating for quite a while on cryoprecipitate. Of course, that changes when you start giving new treatments to new, not previously exposed patients, because instead of their needing to be exposed over several score or hundreds of bags of cryo, the first exposure to a bottle of a concentrate made from hundreds of individuals is going to put the risk straight up there straight away. When did that realisation occur, as far as you can recall? Was that something known in 1978? That was something that um, those who were using the concentrates had become aware of by 1978, and certainly Peter Kernoff was already aware of that from the research he was doing with uh, Dr. Nossel in New York. So he came in with the uh, knowledge of that and the intention to study it in detail. And the, um, the decision to, um, um, to, to shift away from cryoprecipitate to, 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 to concentrates, was that Dr. Kernoff's decision alone? Was that a joint decision? Can you recall? Well, I was there giving concentrates to patients and uh, aware of the advantages we've just discussed. And uh, it was the general agreement that we needed to use concentrates because of the advantages and the fact we could get better control on hemostasis. And um, it was sort of enthusiastically received across the whole field of hemophilic care that concentrates were the way to go. And I was um, part, you know, impressed by the same arguments for the switch. In terms of patients who were not severe haemophiliacs, so mild haemophiliacs, and before you started using DDAVP regularly, which I think you suggested was 1980 or thereabouts, um, so that period, 78 to 80, would mild haemophiliacs have been given concentrates? Uh, yes, they might well have been, yeah. Um, 
just want to look at some of the annual returns with you. I'm not expecting you to remember the, the data that's recorded in them, Professor Chapman, but just so that we can see from the returns what products were, as a matter of fact, being used. So if we could please have, Henry, RFLT 0000362. Um, before we, the, the annual return is buried deep in this document. Before we turn to it, can I just ask you what? Do you know what these documents were? We've got a number of them. There, it says monthly allocation of factor eight. This one happens to be from September 1979, and we can see at the bottom it says photocopies to ET, which I presume is you, PK, um, which would have been Dr. Kernoff and PL, presumably the nursing sister. Yes, Patricia Lilly. So, so that's me, Peter Kernoff, and the uh, uh, senior nurse on the unit. And, and, and what is this document? What does it tell us and what was its purpose at the time? Do you know? Um, these are the beginnings of treatment, uh, summaries of treatment records, uh, which was, of course, to be developed um, far more into the National Haemophilia Database eventually, so we know every product that each patient has received. That's a, where you've got GROW A, that's a patient's name that's it is, been yes. redacted. Yep. Correct, yes. So we can see um, what treatment the patient, uh, one, two, three, four down, um, says allocation. I'm thinking aloud, 8, uh, 10 times 2, 4, 5. So that, yes, those 2, 4, 5, um, that's the number of units. That must have been concentrate because there's a, a serial number for the concentrate batch and the date it was given. Uh, if we go on in this document, Henry, it should be, I hope, page 12. So just, just to clarify, the, the numbers on the monthly allocation, is that the number of bottles? Uh, I, I'm puzzled by that, too. I'm just thinking, if we look at the patient where it says 20, the patients, in fact, I think, the no, you're quite right, yes, 10 will be the number of bottles because each bottle had 245, yes. So the next patient's been allocated 20, but in fact has used 50 bottles. And, and, and so... And curiously, and one of those bottles has got 230 in it. Yes, it's a different kind of batch. So if you look at the batch number, it's HL2619. Batch, yeah. Yes, thanks batch to batch variation. So I think that the allocation would be a kind of guess at expected usage and then what's written in is what they were actually treated with. And then if we go to page 12 please Henry, I hope we have yeah, the annual return for 1979. Um, so we can see towards the top of the page uh, um, this is for um, patients having haemophilia or Christmas disease. So the um, brought together in, in, in one document at this time. Total number of haemophiliac patients treated during the year, 130. Number with factor eight antibodies. We seem to have two numbers there, 14 or 12, but um, let's not worry about that. Number of Christmas disease patients treated during the year, 26. And then if we go down the page, Henry, we can see um, there's usage there of cryoprecipitate um, and NHS factor concentrate, uh, and then larger amounts of profilate and factor eight, so two of the commercial concentrates, uh, and then uh, an amount of co eight, uh, and a smaller amount of Highland. We've then got further down bovine and porcine factor eight. We'll, I'll, I'll ask you about that l later, um, and some fiber or fiber being used. And then for the factor nine column, we can see it's entirely factor nine. NHS factor nine concentrate. So we can see by 1979, um, uh, predominantly concentrates, um, and of those concentrates, predominantly commercial rather than NHS. 
yes. being the fully arranged. And then if we could go, please, Henry, um, to page 18 of this document. And this is just, an, again, part of the annual returns for 1979. It's one of the standard forms. Uh, j just so that we can understand, these were the forms that were submitted by the Haemophilia Centre to Oxford yes. for analysis. And so as well as the summary that we've just looked at, details of every patient, their date of birth, their, their base factor 8 level, whether they had inhibitor, whether they'd been jaundiced, whether they were on home therapy and the type of material, that would all be sent on an annual basis to Oxford at this time. Yes. Do, do you know whether patients were aware that data about them, named data about them, was being sent to Oxford at that time? I don't know. I that's funny. don't recall any discussion about that point. Uh, I would think that there was some awareness that uh, national statistics were being gathered, which was, of course, crucial for our d discussions with the Department of Health. Um, in, in fact, this is a, 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 a side comment. The World Federation of Haemophilia um, has always puts to development of better and new programs in developing countries. The first thing you need is to gather statistics because then you've got some data to present to your Minister of Health. So whether we, I don't remember having a discussion with any patient ever at that time about having details about their treatment sent to a central um, database. Okay. And then if we could look at the returns for 1980, Henry, that's RFLT 0000363. Uh, and we can see the, I think the returns now broken down separately so that the first part of it is, is haemophilia A and carriers of haemophilia A and von Willebrand and then there's a separate return for haemophilia B. So we can see the numbers treated here, 125 haemophilia A, four carriers, 20 of von Willebrand's. And then if we look at the haemophilia A patients' columns, we can see some usage of cryoprecipitate in hospital a very modest amount used for home treatment. Uh, NHS factor concentrate, a small amount used in hospital, a larger amount used for home treatment. Would that have reflected predominantly the, the, the treatment that was being given to children? I think some of that may have gone to adults, um, but probably most of it was to the ch to ch for children. And then we can see there's a range of different commercial products that are being used. So there's some usage of profilate, coate, and haemophil, and then a much larger amount of cryobulin, mm. nearly a million units, and then a still larger amount of factor eight, the armor product, nearly two million units. So by this time, um, we can see here clearly on the returns that the, the move that you've described uh, here towards commercial concentrates as the primary line of treatment? Yes. Uh, and then if we just look over to the von Willebrand's column, do we see there no home treatment for one von Willebrand's patients? So it's all hospital treatment. Mm. Um, uh, uh, it's, in fact, cryoprecipitate being used as the main treatment at that point. Some NHS factor concentrate and a very small amount of commercial concentrates. Yes, cryoprecipitate is rich in von Willebrand factor and particularly the high molecular weight form, which is most effective in dealing with the problem you have in von Willebrand disease, which uh, needs large molecules in the process of forming the first bit of clot, which is a platelet plug. And so it's a, it's a very good treatment for von Willebrand disease. 
Um, concentrates have variable amounts of higher molecular weight von Willebrand factor in them, and it was many years before specific concentrates were developed that were for use in von Willebrand disease. At that time, I see we were had issued some of the factor VIII concentrates, but some of them weren't very effective in those days. The NHS factor VIII concentrate um, was pretty effective. Uh, so the, the, the more you focus on purifying the factor VIII, the less von Willebrand factor activity uh, you have, unless you pay attention to c concentrating that as well. And then if we go on two pages, please, Henry, we can just look at the, the same return, but for haemophilia B. So 25 patients with haemophilia B treated during the year 1980, um, and we can see the ex exclusive treatment, both in hospital and at home, is the NHS factor IX concentrate. Yes. <clears throat> and then just one last set of returns. We don't have, I think, the returns for 1981 or 1982. We've got the 83 returns. Um, Henry, can we have HCDO... 0000184 underscore 006. Hmm. Um, and we can see, um, again, the number of patients at the top, uh, 128 haemophilia A, four carriers, 24 von Willebrands. Um, and then if we look at the uh, pattern of treatment for haemophilia A patients, we can see... Um, uh, a relatively modest amount of cryoprecipitate used for hospital treatment. Um, NHS factor concentrate, um, um, we can see there the usage for home treatment is much more extensive than the usage for hospital treatment, 1.2 million units. But then again, the, the bulk of the treatment, uh, uh, the commercial concentrates, so we've got for both home and hospital treatment over a million units of factor eight and then of CO8, over a million units for home treatment, and 238,000-odd uh, for hospital treatment, um, and uh, similar amounts in terms of hospital and home treatment for haemophil and cryobilin. So, again, the bulk of the products are commercial. I'm intrigued to see that NHS Factor Nine concentrate is being used. That must have been for the patients with inhibitors. Because um, it's in the column of haemophilia A is. patients. Um, we, we see there for the first time, I think, there's um, re express reference to DDAVP. Yes. But as I say, we don't have the, 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 the returns for 81, 82. Um, and then we can see for von Willebrand's, it, it's a mix of cryoprecipitate and NHS factor VIII concentrate. Yes. And then if we go to... Well, just just before you read that, uh, underneath the factor IX concentrate... You have what's described as NHS low hepatitis uh, 8 concentrate. What, what was the low hepatitis NHS product, that, as you recall? Yeah, I was intrigued to see that too. I don't know. I wasn't aware of such an entity. Well, I, that, I, it suddenly occurred to me. I, I don't think we've, we've heard anything about that, have we? No, we've, we know of, of the hepatitis-reduced commercial products mm. um, because we've seen the discussions... Um, UK HCDO, Dr. Ritzer, etc., um, in relation to, to those commercial products, uh, um, we'll need to do some further digging. So, I think in relation Please. to NHS low hepatitis. It's possible, pure speculation now, that these were concentrates batches that had been shown uh, to have a lower risk of inducing hepatitis in uh, treating previously untreated patients. I'm, I'm speculating, if Peter were around, we'd ask him, but I don't know what they were. And, and it's a very but small volume. Small volume. If, if David Lane is questioned uh, at any time in this inquiry, he should know about it. He was director of the yeah. UK fractionation at that time, yeah. Um, and then we can look at the uh, haemophilia B return for 83 briefly, HCDO 0000184 underscore 051, please, Henry. Um, and again, we, so we see 31 
patients with haemophilia B1 carrier, um, apart from a small amount of fresh frozen plasma for carriers, and then what's described as HBVax, um, uh, um, which I'll ask you about in a moment, we can see again it's exclusively NHS factor 9 concentrate. The reference to HBVax, is that to vaccination in relation to hepatitis yes, B? Yes, we, uh, we were vaccinating uh, by then. I was too, actually. It was the um, vaccine that was produced from volunteer donors in the New York gay community who had what we then called Australia antigen, which is one of the antigens of hepatitis B. And so we were um, making sure that all our patients and actually staff were vaccinated. Uh, and then one further document um, in terms of product usage, it's CBLA 0001244, please, Henry. Um, this is a letter from you to Dr. Lane at BPL dated the 23rd of January 1981, and you're providing him with an analysis of factor eight usage at the Royal Free for the calendar year 1979. Um, you, um, and you also refer to the, the, the National Haemophilia Centre returns, which we've, we've looked at for certain years. And you say, I've no doubt that our usage under most treatment categories has increased in 1988 over 1979. Total usage figure for 1979 was, and it's just over 3 million units, and then 1983.4 million units. The number of patients involved was not, I think, significantly different. Uh, and then, just so that we can see the, the attachments that we've, we've found to this letter, if we go to the next few pages, we can see here, haemophiliacs treated with human factor 8 in 1979, and you've set out there the, the patient group by reference to inhibitors, severe, moderate, and mild. And the, we can see there um, the, the relative usage and then the usage in terms of surgery. Um, and then just so that you can you see what else you wrote in closing, Dr. Chidenham, if we just look briefly at the next two pages, there's a table entitled Factor 8 Units Used by Haemophilia Centres in 1979. And then the final page... Haemophilia A patients known at haemophilia centres on the 31st of December 1979. Why were you sending this material to Dr Lane? Do you remember? No. Um, I'd have to speculate. He, he was interested in development of new methods for purification. And um, I think he was interested in projecting future need but more than that I can't say and if we just go back to the letter the first page yes the letter tells us that you're using um, more products for roughly the same number of patients do, do you know why that was we were improving the treatment and management of haemophilia we got more um, home therapy so patients could treat immediately when they felt they had a bleed, when patients uh, were gaining confidence in coming in and having surgeries. Um, it, it was just improving management of haemophilia involves using larger amounts of replacement therapy. Um, and then could we look at um, just there's a, a handful of um, sets of minutes I wanted to look at briefly with you, Dr. Professor Tuddenham. The first is CBLA 0000383. Sorry, I've written that down wrongly, I think, Henry. It's CBLA 0000838. So we can see it's described as a third meeting of directors of haemophilia, associate haemophilia and blood transfusion centres for, and then we can see the regions there, East Anglia, Northwest Thames and Northeast Thames. And the date of the meeting is 1st of September 1978. If we go to the next page, 
we can see the list of those attending. Um, so it's what I think was referred to as a supra-regional meeting with a number of regions gathered together. And we can see um, that, that you were there, Dr. Kernf was there, Dr. Goldman was there, and Mrs. Britton was there um, from the Royal Free, and then a number of others from other hospitals, including Professor Ingram from St. Thomas's. Um, if we could just turn to the third page, please. I mean, no, the fourth page, sorry. You'll see halfway down the page, there's a, uh, an item in the minutes headed distribution of NHS factor eight concentrate. And there's a reference in the third line to, in April 1978, Dr. Dormandy, you, Dr. Alderman, Dr. Davis and Mrs. Britton meeting to try and sort out the distribution of the 360 bottles per month of NHS concentrate allowed to the Northwest Thames, bearing in mind the requirements of the region were much more than this. Now, I don't need to go into the, the detail of it with you, but the, the source of NHS concentrate for you, did you get that from the Regional Transfusion Centre or from BPL? It looks like it's the Regional Transfusion Centre at that time. At that time, it must have been the Regional Transfusion Centre. Um, um, and we, we've heard from, from others or seen reference in other documents in, in some regions to there being shortages of NHS concentrate and specified allocations. Is, is, is that what was the position was for the Royal Free at this time? Yeah, we were in need of more factor concentrates than the uh, NHS uh, could supply, the NHS concentrate. Um, I do remember this meeting. It was the last occasion that Dr. Dormandy was involved actively with um, any such meetings. And I picked her up and drove with her to where we held the meeting and um, took her home afterwards. It was the last time I saw her, actually. Um, and so, yes, we were trying to decide on a fair distribution of a limited resource. And if we go to the next page, please. Um, well, I, I, there's a discussion about, about shortages and Do Dr. Lane's perspective and so on, which I don't need to ask you about. But if we pick it up in the fourth paragraph, beginning Dr. Kernoff felt. Um, uh, so Dr. Kernoff felt that um, this did not solve the problem. That was a issue about allocation. It merely passed it on to someone else. It increased the Royal Free's use of concentrates. They were already overrunning their budget. The problem needed to be dealt with at a regional, super-regional and national levels. And then he says this, only 20% of the Royal Free's requirements were being met with NHS concentrate at present. Despite this, and in accordance with the reference centre director's recommendations, it was the intention to switch home treatment patients from cryoprecipitate to concentrate. So, pausing there, we can see um, this wasn't just a, a patient by patient shift. There were, as it were, there's a policy decision recorded here from yes. the Royal Free, from you and mm -hmm. Dr. Colonel. And then this is said half the home treatment patients at the Royal Free were still using cryoprecipitate. And this was felt to be an unacceptable state of affairs. And that's quite a strong way of putting it. Do you know why Dr. Colonel thought that it was unacceptable to be using cryoprecipitate? Short answer is no, because I didn't discuss this with him at the time, but I think it's fair to speculate that that's unacceptable because of the just practical difficulties of handling, managing, making up and transfusing this uh, primitive, as it seems by comparison to the freeze-dried concentrate, uh, cryoprecipitate material. <coughs> and then it, the minutes continue. If NHS concentrate was not available, then commercial concentrate would have to be bought, and the returns show us that that's exactly what happened. Um, and then this, the extra cost might not be very great since the cost of cryo to the Royal Free was not inconsiderable. And taking into account the unitage, it worked out at almost the same price as commercial concentrates. Now, I don't think we've seen this elsewhere so far, no. Professor Chidenham. Um, um, this suggests that the Royal Free was having at that time to actually pay for cryoprecipitate. Yes. C can you record anything about that? 
No. No. Peter dealt with all of that. But it is impressive that it's almost the same price. <laughs> we were using a lot of cryo. And then there's just one further passage in these minutes. If we could go on two pages, please, Henry. Uh, if we look at the paragraph in the bottom half of the page, it's headed possible problems of blood donations from family members of patients on home treatment. Dr. Kernoff mentioned an incident that had taken place at the Royal Free Hospital where the mother of a patient on home treatment pricked herself and subsequently developed hepatitis. Before becoming ill, she donated blood, which had apparently been administered to a patient. The boy himself was positive to hepatitis B antigen, although remained asymptomatic. Um, so pausing there, is it correct to read this as the, the mother um, developed hepatitis B? Yes. Uh, and then this, Dr. Kernoff pointed out that family members of patients on home treatment should be considered high risks for transmission of hepatitis and should not be allowed to donate blood. I don't know whether you recall anything about this particular incident. No, but if her son clearly was a carrier of hepatitis B and uh, handling blood from someone who's a hepatitis B carrier is a notoriously high risk for transmission. And as we see, happened here. Um, I'm going to turn to some UK HCDO minutes. So I note the time, it's 11. Is that a convenient point at which to take uh, the first break? Yes, it is. We, we have a, a break um, every morning uh, for, for coffee or refreshment. Um, uh, and normally it's, it's 45 minutes. So we'll take that uh, 45 minutes, uh, quarter to 12, if you please. And, sir, if you could explain to Professor Tidnam the position in relation to yes, discussing evidence. Um, uh, professor, you're, you're giving evidence. Uh, you must not talk to anyone, whoever they are. Uh, it includes the council, um, those with you, uh, uh, and so on, about your evidence, either what you have said or what you may you think you may be asked to say. You can talk about anything else you like. 